Great engineering managers practice an inclusive management style. What does that mean? And how can you cultivate one? Well, in this episode of the Engineering Career Coach Podcast, Jen Bunk, career coach for tech managers, is going to tell us exactly how to do it. She's going to list the points that you can use to create and cultivate an inclusive management style with your team. Let's jump right in. All right, and now I'm excited to welcome in our guest, or I should say welcome back our guest for today, Jen Bunk. Jen is a career coach for tech managers, and she is the CEO of the People Stack. Jen, welcome back to the Engineering Career Coach Podcast. Thanks, Anthony. So, so awesome to be here today. So for our listeners and our audience that maybe didn't hear the last episode with you and aren't familiar with what you do, maybe in your own words, give them a little bit of a background on you know, how you spend your days. Yeah. Well, how I spend my days, our mission, my mission and our mission at the People Stack is to help technical managers upgrade their careers, to really walk the path toward whatever it is that their dream career is. And that means commanding a premium salary of at least 200K a year if you live in a uh, a place, a high cost of living place, like say San Francisco or the, you know, the Bay Area, it's going to be higher than that. Maybe it'll be a little bit lower in certain parts of the country, but it's really getting paid for the value um, that you're adding and doing that with, uh, with a Zen-like work-life balance. So that's really what it is that we do. We, look at, we focus exclusively on coaching technical managers. That's awesome. And you know, like you said, everyone can give some kind of value. And I think a lot of engineering managers, technical managers, they, you know, they're giving value, but they're not necessarily getting in what they should in return. And sometimes they're just not comfortable, um, you know, making it clear what that value is. And I don't think you need to do it in a way that is, you know, necessarily like they're bragging, but I know even like in my life as a consulting engineer, you know, it was important to kind of let the, to let the clients understand the value that we provided to them so that they knew that what differentiated us from maybe other consultants or other engineering companies. And um, some people are uncomfortable with that, but if you're uncomfortable with that and your uh, competitors are not, then you're kind of going to lose out. So I think what you're doing is very, very important and I'm really happy you're doing it. So thanks for doing it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. All right. So we're going to talk today about an inclusive management style. We're doing a lot of research at EMI. We've identified kind of four key drivers of great engineering managers being an inclusive management style, providing career growth opportunities for their team, interpersonal engagement, and the ability to manage projects. And we're going to talk to Jen today. We're really going to touch on two of those, the inclusive management style and interpersonal engagement. We're going to focus a little bit more on the inclusive management style. And so, Jen, let's kind of dive right into this because it is an interesting topic. It's certainly something that listeners out there can start to do in their careers if they want to, you know, kind of create that um, that kind of atmosphere that's much more comfortable for their team. And I know that one of the first things that you like to focus on, or kind of in the in the list of points that we're going to go through, is is building trust. So maybe we can start with that. Yeah, absolutely. So it it has to start with trust. So when I think of inclusive leadership, I think of how do we include everyone who we possibly can. And that means not only making sure that you're communicating to everyone that you possibly can and including them in conversations, but it also means empowering everyone that you possibly can. So if you're an engineering manager and you have a team, that means empowering everyone on your team and hopefully even everyone in your organization to do what it is that they are great at. So and you, can't, you can't do that and you cre- can't create that space for making sure that everyone's included and has their room to shine and show their superpowers. You cannot do that if you don't have trust. So it has to start with building trust and it's not just a one-time thing. Um, that's the other thing that I would add for now um, that we can, we can talk about this more and unpack it even more, but like, it, it can't just be one conversation that builds trust. You got to start somewhere. And so it starts usually with one conversation, but it's really about a series of conversations that are going to happen over weeks and months and often years. And that's how trust is built. Yeah, that's great. And I like that point there at the end of how, you know, it can't be a one-time thing. I think that with these four key drivers, I mean, we can tell an engineering manager, a technical manager, like here are four 
drivers that if you do these things well, you're going to become a great manager. Your team's going to love you. So that's great. But you can't then take those four things and go through them like an engineering punch list and just say, done, 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 done. It's more like something that you need to cultivate uh, habits. Like I always tell my kids, build better habits, always build better habits, build better habits. So you got to cultivate these habits around these four drivers all the time in your career and all the conversations with your team and all the emails with your team and all the correspondence with clients and different things. And so I think that's an important, important thing to highlight here at the beginning of Jen and I's conversation, because as we go through some of these different points, these are things that have to just become normal for you um, that have to just become all the time things. And it happens for great managers. It happens even if you go into sports and you look at the teams that tend to win consistently over and over, it's because they're building better habits and doing all the right things. So that's yeah. something to keep in mind. So Jen, the next point that we want to dive into a little bit is, you know, getting to know your, your team. Talk about yeah. that. Yeah. So a lot of times people say, okay, great. I understand that I need to build trust. How do I do that? And there's no, there's no easy way. Like we just talked about, it's about developing those habits and that happens over time. It's really about thinking about your career and building the path to leadership mastery as a marathon. But how you start is with, with conversations and how you start is really by getting to know every single one of your team members, every single one of the people who you work with, um, all of the, the stakeholders, all of the decision makers for the projects that you're working with. And so when I say know them, um, often what I, what I tell my clients is know them, know them to their bones. And what I mean is like know them, like know their soul, like see the inside of them and enter their world and really understand where it is that they're coming from. And then you even take it to the next level and you say, okay, I can actually even appreciate where they're coming from. Like, cause it's one thing to keep an intellectual and say, oh yeah, I get it. Right. Especially if you've been there before right? and, you, and you've experienced something that they've experienced before or been on a similar project before or have a similar personality. It's really easy to build trust with people and to know people um, and to appreciate people who are the same as us and have similar backgrounds and who have been on similar projects as we have. Or if it's if it's a project kind of project that you've been on before, that's really easy. The, the challenge comes when it's people who are different different backgrounds, or maybe there's something new and contextually, it's a new kind of project or a new kind of challenge to, to, to tackle. So it's really, then it becomes even more important to, to really know where everyone is coming from and, and appreciate that, like really understand who they are as a person, their personality, their beliefs, their values, their experiences, their triggers, like what might trigger them, like the negative and the positive triggers, like what might trigger them to like, just be very, you know, to get angry or to get, get a, maybe, maybe even hostile or aggravated or demotivated. And then also like, what, what are the things that, that tend to put them in those kinds of states, but then also the positive side of it as well. What gets them motivated? What really gets them in the place of, of joy and I want to do this and let's do this together team. And so that happens over time, but the only way that you can really do that is again, is through a series of conversations and a series of communicating with people and really asking the questions and listening so that you can really appreciate where it is that they're coming from. Yeah. And again, it's, it's another one of those things, as you can see, which is a pattern here that, you know, you have to do on a regular basis. You have to continue to do it. You know, you're not going to get to know someone overnight, right? So you're constantly doing the learning. And another thing that this, I think really kind of highlights is one of the bigger challenges of engineers and technical professionals becoming successful managers is the variable that gets thrown in once you become a manager, which is people right? People <laughs> yes. are like totally different. It's not like an engineering equation. It's not like a, a problem you can solve. Every person is different. Everyone acts differently. Everyone has different communication patterns, different responses to different things. And so unless you know people and you get to know people well, you can't learn their different patterns and work with them the best that you can. I mean, you know, part of management, in my opinion, is you know, you have to know kind of the strengths of each person on your team, some of the challenges they have and, you know, things that they like to do or don't like to do so that you can kind of manage effectively. And so, you know, to Jen's point, when you get to know people, you can much better manage kind of the relations between you and the different team members and really get the most out of everybody and, and put people 
in the best positions to succeed, which I guess kind of goes in well to our next point, which is making assumptions or, or not making assumptions. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. <laughs> right. Right. And so to sort of dovetail, dovetail out of this, like we're talking about, and to tie it back to the larger idea of inclusive leadership, right? There, there's no way that you're going to empower others to be their best and make sure that they're actually included as part of this game, as part of this fabulous journey of building whatever it is that you're building together. There's no way that you're going to be able to do that without trust, without really knowing that. And if you make assumptions, <laughs> there's... So a lot of the times when clients come to me with, with challenges or problems, it's, it's not all the time, but there's a, a pattern that comes up is they're making an assumption about what other people are thinking or feeling. When really the way to kind of solve that problem and just nip it in the bud, bud is just ask, like, I'm curious, why did you say that? You know, I'm curious, why did you make that decision? You know, you can get up all in, all up in your head about like, oh man, they they decided to put this other person on the project and not my team member because da 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 da, da they hate me and they know they're against me, right? And you we, can, we go there, right? And but and you could, and that's fine, and you recognize it. We're we're, we're human. We we feel things like fear and, and and anger and disgust sometimes. But to to move out of that. It, a lot of times the best way is to just not make an assumption about it and ask the person with curiosity, with compassion, Hey, I'm curious why you put this person on the project and not my team member, because I thought my team member would have been a great fit for this project. That's cool. You know, this other person is, is going to rock it. It's going to be awesome. But in the future, I'd love for you to consider my team, mem team member for this. So can we start a dialogue, dialogue about this? Sometimes it's that simple, but like you were mentioning in the beginning, Anthony, that sometimes people feel a little bit, weird or don't want to open up these conversations, like especially when it's around like self-promotion or anything like that, but anything resembling self-promotion or talking about like even promoting somebody else who's on your team. But it's often about saying and asking the hard thing. That thing that you don't want to ask that person, right? That, that thing that you don't want to ask, that conversation that you don't want to have is very often the exact conversation that you need to have. Yeah, for sure. And I think that goes into the next point, I guess, just to drive it home a little bit more is was ask a lot of questions, which is, you know, kind of what you're framing out there. But I think, you know, this is something, again, that happens consistently. Like if you get into a staff meeting, you know, what happened on this project? We had some trouble. Let's talk through it a little bit. Tell us, you know, what worked, what didn't work. And you have to keep asking questions. I think one of the challenges sometimes with leaders is that we tend to think like maybe we reached a certain level, which means we know more than the people that we're leading, but a lot of times they have more answers than us. That's definitely part of it, right? And that's definitely part of not making assumptions, especially as we get more and more removed from what our team is doing. And that just naturally happens right. as, you, as you become more and more experienced as a leader. Like it, it may start to be, it's, it's two, three, five, sometimes even 10 or 15 years since you've been doing what they're doing on a daily basis. You're developing as a leader for sure. You're developing leadership skills, but not making assumptions about, you know, the way that something should be done or how it should be built, for example. Um, but it's also about just it's it's really a key to to building that trust is asking more questions than making more statements um it in really like my favorite question to ask if you're like okay i want to ask more questions can you just give me one it's why right, right. <laughs> like it, because often what's missing from this whole equation of making sure that people are truly included as part of a mission is that there's no mission Right. And there's no way to include people in a mission if that mission isn't there or if it's not clear. Um, and yes, the, the onus is on senior leadership to make sure that that mission is there and that mission is clear. But the onus is also on the managers and the team members to, to if they're not sure what the mission is, to ask, right? Why are we doing this? Okay, I get that that's why. Why are we doing that? Like the five whys, you know what I mean? Right, right. And you can really get to the heart of why am I here? You know, the existential question of why am I here in this seat eight plus hours a day? Like, it's not just to build stuff. Right. It, there's a larger mission here. And, and if people, and if you could help people get connected to that and ask those why questions more often to team members, to senior leadership, to everyone, then all, that's also going to create a more inclusive environment as well. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think a big part of an inclusive environment is including your team in the bigger mission or vision of the company or of the project that they're working on. So if you tell me to go and, you know, design this roadway or portion of a roadway and I'm doing that all day, three weeks in a row, it can become monotonous. But if I understand that this roadway is going to, you know, get people safely one place to another, whatever the case may be, you know, it takes on a bigger meaning because I'm being included in what the overall picture is. And I know that that's an important part of it ties into a bunch of these four drivers is, you know, connecting people with, you know, the bigger picture of what's, what they're working on so that they do feel really a part of that. So I think that that kind of all comes together there. For sure. And then the other thing that I would add on there before we move to the next point is that what a lot of people miss because, you know, folks like you, folks like me, we talk a lot about organizational mission, like know the mission of your organization. Like what, why, why are you going to work? Why do you, why are you building the things that you're building at the end of the day? But the other thing that I would add to that, that so many people miss is what's my mission in my career? What's my individual mission? as a leader and knowing that that that's going to help you show up better as a leader and be a more inclusive leader as well because you're going to be able to behave according to that mission and get people on board with that mission as well and you're going to be more motivated to to do better and to always show up as the best leader possible so that's the other thing that i would add in terms of mission is yes know what your organization's mission is but also make sure you know what your mission is for your career and how, what kind of leader that you want to be. Yeah, great point. And that's something too that I can see for managers that can some can fall through the cracks because you're thinking about your projects, you're thinking about everything else and you're not thinking about, and you're thinking about, maybe you are thinking about the bigger mission of the company and you're not thinking about, you know, what is this person interested in specifically? And where do they want right. to go? Right, yeah. And the more that we connected, get connected with our own missions, then that's how we're reminded, oh, wow, people on my team have career missions as well. Like I know one of the things, one of the pillars is, is about career development, right? Like right. really making sure that you're talking about the career development of your team members. So that's going to overlap with this. And so if you, if you don't really have a sense of how you want to develop your own career and you haven't done that intentionally, you're not really going to be able to help somebody else do that. But if you're doing it for yourself and you've been on that path and you've made some mistakes along the way, like that's actually even better because then you can help your team to do that as well and be empowered to have the careers and build the careers that they want to build. Yeah, which is also goes to a larger point that if you are a manager and you're focused on these four key drivers and you are practicing them, your team members are also by habit learning them and they're going to exhibit those drivers and their management styles and they're going to become great managers as well. And then, you know, there you, that's how you cultivate, you know, a, a very positive leadership culture throughout an organization. It starts with, you know, the managers building, building habits. So, all right. So Jen, talk about compassion and empathy and how that they're tied into an inclusive manager. Or yeah, they're, they're tied into it because of trust. Right. So we, we started out talking about trust. How do you build an inclusive team, an inclusive organization? Well, it all starts with trust. How do you build that trust? You have to have empathy. And this kind of touches on what I started to talk about before around, yeah, you, you have to know them. You have to understand them. But it has to go beyond, yeah, yeah, I get it. Right. It has to go beyond the intellectual understanding of, Yes, I under I get it. I I can give you a five step plan on how to get through this. Right, that's important. Like that's the strategy and that's the tactics. But when we're talking about empathy, it's really about that heart to heart connection, feeling their pain, like like literally for a second, feeling what it is that they might be feeling, because then that's really when you're going to be able to enter their world and say, oh wow, I don't just get it up here. I get it here at my heart as well. And now we can move forward from a place of having that, that heart to heart understanding because especially with engineers, right? Engineers, are, you're super smart, right? <laughs> you're super motivated, but we, we live up here most of our day because we have to, right? Because right. if we make mistakes, then 
then the bridge collapses, then, then the, the, the road isn't built as, as well as it could be or whatever else it might be. Um, and that's, in, that's an important part of, of our jobs as engineers and as people who build stuff, right? Like safety is, is important and, and, mitig and mitigating risk is important. So, but that's, so that's why we stay up here, why we stay up in our heads. But it's really kind of cultivating that, that muscle and that habit of learning how to move out of your head and into your heart and having that empathy and having that feeling for, for another team person, for another team member, or for another person. Um, that that's, you know, if, if there's a number two thing that, that clients come to me the most with, it's, you know, how do I deal with this person? I can't, I don't get it. Right. So number one is don't make assumptions, but then number two is really kind of feel what it is that they're going through. Right. Um, like for example, a team member might be underperforming. Right. Um, and for some people where we might go is, oh, man, what's going on? Like, you're not, you're not motivated. You got to, you know, you got to, you got to just start working harder and like, you might start to get frustrated with them or, who knows, right? They're, they're underperforming and you just start to, to blame them and it just, it just becomes this, this, this whole thing. When, so you notice how you might be making assumptions there without having a conversation with them. But when you do have the conversation about, okay, you're not performing up to par anymore, what's going on? It's really about listening to them and understanding where it is that they're coming from. Now, I'm not saying to make excuses for anyone. Like we have performance standards that we want to meet. Right. And it's about getting them back up to those performance standards. Like, for example, they may be going some, through something at home. Like maybe their mom just died and they didn't and they didn't tell you and you don't know that. And by the way, they're not going to tell you that unless there's that trust. But let's say let's say something catastrophic happened in their family and they're, and they're dealing with something outside of work. You want to create that space for them to be able to share that with you. And then you could say, OK. I'm going to give you, you know, a couple of days off so that you can go grieve and spend some time with your family. My heart goes out to you. And then you can, you can come back, you know, after a couple of days. And so we can all, you know, sort of experience that and, and feel that in our hearts, because even if you haven't experienced that exact thing, we have that capability as humans to have that heart to heart connection. So that's what the empathy is really about. Yeah. And I think while empathy can be, you know, difficult and you need to really practice it, I do think that what engineers have going for them often is that in most cases, they've been through the engineering ranks, like the people on their team are going through now. So they kind of do have somewhat of an understanding of what they're going through in terms of the career ladder and, you know, when the, what they're dealing with on some of the projects and with some of the clients and some of the stressors involved in that, which I think for me was, all, was always helpful um, in management as an engineer, because, you know, I felt like in those ways I could relate. Um, mm -hmm. But I agree with Jen and, and that getting to know them also more on the personal side will help you even more with that because you'll be able to relate to some of their other situations and, and circumstances. So that that's very helpful. For sure. So our last point here, Jen, before we jump into our, our take action segment is talking about controlling people, what we can and can't do. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. One of the things, so if we're talking about inclusive leadership and really the larger, the larger goal here is how can I be the best leader I can possibly be? How can I show up as that superhero leader um, and make the largest impact that I possibly can? And one of the larger concepts that often comes up when people ask questions around this is control. And often where people get stuck is they're focusing on things that they cannot control. Mm. Oh my God, my boss is, hasn't given me a promotion, right? I've tried and tried and tried for the last three, six, nine months, two years, and my boss just won't give me a promotion. And if you focus on it from that perspective and have that internal dialogue going on, what you're focusing on is in the way that you're looking at it is what you can control. Because at the end of the day, let's just say in this case, it would be your boss's decision whether or not to give you that promotion. You cannot control, you cannot like control your boss like a robot and just make him <laughs> give you and like reprogram your boss to give you a promotion. Right? But instead, you can focus on what we can control, which is how we show up. So what we can control is how we respond to other people. 
So yes, your boss may say, yeah, I'm not really sure. There's still a few more skills that need to, you know, need to get upgraded before you, before you um, get a promotion. So you can choose in that moment to play the blame and shame and how dare you game. But if you do that, then you're focusing on what you can't control. But if you say, okay, I get it. There's still a few skills. There's still a little bit more measurable impact that I need to give and, and show in these areas. What can I do? How can I show up? So like that's one bigger example that has much more uh, higher stakes, uh, potentially higher stakes results there. But even if it's just like, I don't know, someone, someone like blows you off or something, like, like you're supposed to meet with them. Right, you're supposed to meet them at ten o'clock, and you're and you're sitting there, and you're like, "Where's Where's Jane? Like Jane's supposed to meet with me." Right. If you play the blame and shame game, or Jane, oh my God, Jane's always late. I can't believe it. Ugh, she's such she's she's so terrible. How can she do this to me? But like, you can't control whether or not Jane's on time. Like that's Jane's choice. <laughs> you know, what I mean? poor Jane. We, if there's Jane's out there, we love you. <laughs> but instead, you can say, "All right, gee, I wonder what's going on." Like again turn on that compassion and that empathy. Oh, wow, I hope Jane's okay. I hope everything's okay. And then just focus how you can respond in that moment. All right, cool. I, got, I, I can spend 15 minutes. I can, I can respond to some Slack message, like messages. I can respond to some emails. And if she's not here in 15 minutes, I can just decide that she either forgot about it or something else came up. So it's focusing on what we can control versus what we can't. We can control other people. We can control our reactions and how we show up. Yeah, that's awesome. And I'm actually rereading this book that I like a lot right now called Zen and the Art of Happiness by Chris Prentice. And there's a great line in the book where he says, stress is not, doesn't come from the events that happen to us. It, they come from how we respond to those events. That's how stress is created. So, yeah. you know, exactly yeah. to your point, you know, something happens to you inevitably, especially in the world of engineering on engineering projects, things happen all the time. And you know, the way that you respond to those will have a major impact in terms of your success overall. But Absolutely. Certainly Absolutely. The way you interact with people too. Yeah. And then the other thing that I would stack on top of that is there's a difference between reacting and responding. Because where a lot of people might go here is we're like, well, I'm going to feel angry. Like if Jane's late, I'm going to feel angry, right? Like that's okay. You can, like, there's, there's that knee jerk reaction. Right. Like when when the doctor hits your knee, it's going to it's going to there's going to be a reaction. It's just it's almost physiological. And to that, to a certain extent, we may not be able to control that because we're human. We feel things. Right. We can't always control what it is we're going to feel in a given moment. So it's like allowing yourself to have that reaction of, yeah, I feel angry. I feel sad. I feel worried. I feel fearful. I'm scared. Like allowing that sitting with it for a moment giving it a label like, yeah, I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> I don't know if I can swear or not, but, <laughs> right? but like, I'm really scared out of my mind right now. And then you can choose how you respond to that, right? That's what we have control over. We can then say, all right, I can respond to this fear and like curl up into a ball and cry and like never come out of it, right? <laughs> or I could say, all right, the fear's there. Why is the fear there? how can I turn that fear into an opportunity or whatever it is? Sure. You know? So it's, it's really like distinguishing between the, the, the reaction that, that knee jerk, like gut reaction that we're going to feel because we're human. And then what happens in the five to 30 seconds after that and how we respond. Right. And, and I know probably a lot of listeners are thinking like, well, that's impossible. Everyone's going to have that like knee jerk reaction. But what I found myself and just working on this specifically is that, it is, again, the cultivation of, of a habit. It's a mindset, actually. You're changing your mindset so that when, you, when things happen, you, there's like a little bit more space for you to you know, respond and say like, okay, let me think about this. Maybe there's something really great that I could take out of this as opposed to not. So um, yeah. it's, again, none of this stuff is easy. If it was, everybody would be doing it. So the, 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 idea, the idea between uh, Jen and I having a conversation here is to bring some points out that you can try to work on if they work for you and integrate them into your management style. Yep. So with that, Jen's going to stick with me and we're going to come back in a minute and we're going to wrap this one up with our take action today segment and give you something actionable that you can take and try to become a little bit more inclusive in your style. All right, we're back with Jen Bunk. Jen is a career coach for tech managers and CEO 
of the people stack. And today we're talking about an inclusive management style, which we found to be one of the four key drivers of successful engineering managers. Real quick, I just want to recap some of the, the points that Jen ran through here, and then we're going to wrap it up with you and give you something that you can do immediately. Jen talked about, you know, building trust with your team members. It's something that you have to do all the time, not just something that you're doing every so often. You need to build that trust with them. You need to really get to know them, you know, kind of enter into their world so that you can, you know, build that kind of level of engagement and, and that inclusive management style. Don't make assumptions. Um, you know, that's something you need to ask and flush things out as opposed to making assumptions. And in terms of asking, ask a lot of questions because the more information you can get, then you can have that inclusive style. You don't have to guess at things and have people think you're not, you know, connected with them necessarily. Jen talked about compassion and empathy, really putting yourself in your team member's shoes. If you want to become inclusive and, and include them in, in things, you need to understand how they think and what they're going through. And then lastly, we talked about controlling what you can control. You, know, you can't control what other people do necessarily, but you certainly can control the way you respond to it. And so kind of cultivating that mindset. So, all great stuff, Jen. What we want to do now is give our listeners maybe one thing. They listen to this and they're maybe on their way into work. They're on the bus, on the train, on their commute. When they get there, they want to start to be more inclusive. What can they do? Ask more questions. Ask more questions than, the, than statements. Right? So take a look and, it, and be more mindful of, okay, what I just said there, was that a question or was that a statement? And set a goal that in any given day, you are going to ask more questions than making statements. Because when you ask questions, then that allows you to then build trust and get to know people and not make assumptions and have empathy for people and control what you can control. Um, it, it gives you that, that perspective that you're not going to have if you didn't ask the questions. Very often, we get into statement-making mode. So that's what I would challenge everybody to do is get out of statement-making mode and ask more questions. Awesome. And again, that is something you could do today when you get to the office, you know, you get into a staff meeting get in a conversation with someone, ask some questions. And to Jen's point, you do have to be careful because sometimes we go into it saying we're going to ask more questions, but we start asking a question and we end up with a statement. Like we ended up saying something. So all of these That's things, all of these things are things that you, what you need to just do is be aware of them, right? Changing anything begins with awareness. And if you if you catch yourself and say, okay, I'm making a statement instead of a question, let me make an adjustment. As long as you can stop yourself, you can make that adjustment. And I think that's what management's all about. It's continually improving, uh, continuous improvement, refining your tools, your strategies, the actions you take. And if you keep working on it, there's no doubt that you can develop these four key drivers or developing each one of them. And I think the inclusive one is important because it ties in closely with some of the other ones, like we talked about the engagement, mm -hmm. the providing career growth, right? They're kind of very layered together. So Jen, thank you again for coming on the podcast for a second time. We are really taking advantage of all of your, your insight here and uh, we do appreciate it and how you really laid those out for people. And real quick, before we let you go, if our listeners want to learn a little bit more about you and some of the programs or the coaching that you offer, what's the best way for them to do that? You can check out our website. It's thepeoplestack.com. Awesome. Jen, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Had a great time. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please leave your comments and or questions in the comments section below this video. Also, if you'd like to view the full show notes for this episode, visit engineeringmanagementinstitute.org or see the link in the video description. There you will find the key points discussed in today's episode as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during the episode. Until next time, I wish you the best in all of your engineering career endeavors.